Good morning. My name is Josh Pachter. I'm a senior here at the University of Rochester, studying computer science and philosophy. My senior year project has been on the topic of ethical decision making in autonomous vehicles, and specifically this idea of how we might go about mitigating bias when programming autonomous vehicles. So you guys have probably heard of self-driving cars. They sometimes look like this. And more than you know, there's self-driving technology in the cars that you buy today. And this trend will only continue as we move forward. The technology is amazing in that it enables new efficiencies and optimizations, but we also have to do a lot of work to make sure that this technology is safe so that people want to use it and feel comfortable having this as an everyday experience. So what do I mean when I talk about safety in autonomous vehicles? Well, some of you may have seen this problem in a different kind of context. This is a famous ethical issue that's several decades old called the trolley problem. And for those of you who don't know, the idea is that you as a bystander are witnessing a trolley that has unfortunately lost its brakes, sort of hurtled down the track at five people who are stuck there facing their imminent demise. And uh, you are watching this horrific situation and have the choice to pull a lever that's just in front of you. And if you do so, you'll divert the trolley onto a separate track just ahead. And instead of killing the five people, you'll kill one. So this is a classic problem. People have gone back and forth for as long as the problem has been around, and they'll probably continue to do that for a lot longer, because it's already been several decades. More importantly than which you choose in this scenario is why you chose it, of course. The question is, what are our ethics? What should we do? Which is where it becomes interesting in the context, again, of self-driving cars. A few years ago, a group at MIT Media Lab made this project called the MIT Moral Machine, and it's a website you can log on to and choose between these trolley-like scenarios, and they sort of extrapolated from the trolley problem with several different factors besides just five and one. Um, and it's really interesting, and they've obviously collected a ton of data on what people tend to do. Um, but sometimes what people tend to do isn't enough, and it certainly isn't enough to know what we should do, because what people think and what's right is often totally different. So we still run into a pretty important problem which is that when we program autonomous vehicles, we can't simply instill our own moral theory because we don't know it well enough. And if someone thinks they know it, they're probably wrong, or someone will disagree with them. So it's a big problem. What we do know is that autonomous vehicles should, be, do, should do the following things well. They should align with our values and advocate as our proxies. They should be able to perform even better than humans because even the best human drivers aren't good enough for our self-driving cars. And lastly, they should use machine learning to get there, which is one of the key enabling features of modern artificial intelligence. Um, for those of you who aren't as familiar with machine learning, the idea is that you can apply it to solving abstract problems by using logic, math, and statistics. So if there's some goal we want to accomplish, but we don't know exactly how to get there, we can use machine learning to help us. Um, there's a few different kinds of machine learning that um, I'm going to talk about that are pretty important to the front of this problem of self-driving cars, I think. One sort of option is supervised learning. It's a pretty common approach. And um, the idea is that we provide a huge data set. And we provide all this data, and we go through this process of training. And in doing so, we demonstrate how we might go about doing some behavior. Um, and then through this process of training, the algorithm will learn to predict our behavior. Um, so a classic example of this is image classification. So we might have a lot of images of cats and dogs, and along with that, we'll have these sort of ground truth labels of cat and dog that we supply along with the images. And it'll, certain, it'll start to learn that a cat image looks like this, and a dog image looks like this by extrapolating abstract patterns. And eventually, we'll be able to feed it a new image, and it'll say, oh, that's a cat, or that's a dog. Um, and the problem with this approach is that we need to be able to provide this massive set of data. And if we don't feel comfortable providing this massive set of data, then we maybe shouldn't take this approach. Reinforcement learning is another um, option. And the idea here is that instead of providing a huge amount of data, we can provide some sense of value or reward. And then by, through the process of training, the algorithm can learn to maximize that reward and make decisions that help align with that award, reward. And they can choose to not make decisions that are against that reward. The problem here in terms of bias is that we have to feel comfortable specifying rewards. So in this case, we might have a mouse robot or a mouse AI navigating a maze that starts randomly by trial and error. And we specify through the maze some negative utilities and some positive utilities. And eventually, it'll get burned by the negative utilities and choose the good paths instead. So we have to feel comfortable supplying these rewards in any setting where we want to use reinforcement learning. A more complex 
example of these seemingly simple approaches would be something like this. And for those of you who don't recognize this, this is an ancient Chinese board game called Go. And it's become the gold standard for a lot of artificial intelligence research. It's really complex. It's a 19 by 19 board, and there's more possible configurations of the game than there are particles in the universe. So needless to say, it's really complicated, and it's also why it's a great way to test our artificial intelligence. So there's a group called DeepMind, which is now Google, that's been doing these really interesting um, AIs called AlphaGo, which are AIs that play this game, and they beat the best human players out there. The most recent one, and arguably most interesting for our purposes, is AlphaGo Zero, which, as the name suggests, starts from a really low level of intelligence, as you can see. We give it very limited information up front. We don't provide a huge data set. We might provide um, the rules of the game and how you might generate the following legal move, and that's about it. And from that, it learns to play tremendously well. And if you look back to the graph, it actually learns to play better than any other version of Go. Um, the dashed line of the graph there represents the benchmark of, of, of human play, a human expert play from another version called AlphaGo Lee. And you'll see that a supervised learning approach in purple doesn't quite pass it because it never can. Because as we said, supervised learning is just predicting our behavior. But AlphaGo Zero in blue there is able to surpass the previous previously unsurpassable standard before too much time is even necessary in training. And this means it can innovate in really clever ways and play really clever moves. And one of the versions of AlphaGo that used the same kind of approach, it played a move against the world champion Go player that no one expected and thought was a mis everyone thought was a mistake. But it turns out it won the game a few moves later and it sparked incredible discourse amongst Go enthusiasts. So that's a really cool board game. Um, but self-driving cars are really complicated. And more so than that, they also matter in a way that board games don't. Because if a self-driving car messes up, uh, someone could die. So we want to pay a little more attention to what we, how we program those cars. What are the differences then between a really clever approach like AlphaGo Zero and what we would need to change in order to get something like autonomous cars to work as we want them to? Well, for one, the rules of AlphaGo Zero and, or, or Go are really defined quite well. But the rules, so to speak, of the problem of self-driving cars are not. I mean, these are the moral rules we were talking about before that are so elusive, and we can't possibly be the ones to state them explicitly and pin them down, because if we're wrong, the consequences would be catastrophic. There's also this other issue that the following states, the sort of what could happen next, is not as clearly defined. Even though in Go there's many different options, you could technically enumerate them if you wanted to. And in the real world, that's just not the way it is. Something crazy could happen. The Millennium Falcon could fall from the sky. Um, and we don't know. So how do we sort of solve this? Well, just, I think to solve the first problem, this idea of not having rules, we have to create something that we give this algorithm innately. Uh, I say that we have to create some notion of primitive value, something that's fundamental and unwavering, some kind of moral truth that most people would not be inclined to disagree with. This might be something like all sentient life or all human life has intrinsic moral worth, something like that. Um, and then from there, we would let the machine do more of the work instead of us providing these explicit rules and risking getting it wrong. What I mean by that is with an approach like AlphaGo Zero's, you can provide something base like this, like, a, like the rule of the game, and have it figure out through the trial and error process of searching and playing itself what decisions lead to good moves that are aligned with these values and what decisions lead to really terrible moves that aren't aligned with these values. So it will abstract and create higher level moral truths without us having to do it. And to solve the problem of not knowing a following state, we could have a separate system that has some knowledge of physical laws. Of course, this is immensely complex, but it's not unthinkable. Car manufacturers and automakers have tons of data on car crashes and what people generally do wrong. So we already have a good sense of what might not be a good idea to, to do or what might lead to a crash. Let's return to this notion of primitive value. And no, that's not a mistake. Um, what this means is that maybe raising our robots is not so different from raising our children, in some sense. We don't tell our children everything or make them carbon copies of us because it's impossible. We can't. We might try, but we can't. Um, instead, I think what it might be like is a child with a natural curiosity who's exploring the world but has this underlying innate machinery. For example, we all have a sense of pain doesn't mean we know what causes pain or we know what not to do. We have to find that out through messing up. But a child might touch a really hot stove and then afterwards probably never do it again because it really hurt. 
Um, and that process is crucial. That's their exploration. And it's the very same thing as AlphaGo Zero or what I'm suggesting here. We have to supply something innately, but we can't supply everything innately. That has to be done through self-play. So what this means is that um, we have this sort of evolutionary approach. And um, an evolutionary approach means that we sort of provide something, and then we allow for a machine to figure out more on its own. And you might be thinking, well, that, that sounds good, but is that really enough? Is it enough to just provide some really small bit of primitive moral truth and trust that the machine gets it? Of course not. It's not going to cut it. And it might go terribly wrong, because we don't want to just do that. What we can do instead is we can start with that. And then through that process of training, we can make checkpoints along the way where we say, here's a scenario. What are you going to do in this scenario? And we can see if it makes sense and if people agree that it makes sense or if it's a terrible idea. And if it's a terrible idea, we can provide that feedback. If it's a terrible idea, we can say no. And instead of specifying a structural change explicitly ourselves, or going in manually and changing some code, we can have it do, the machine do it itself. It can say, since it's just a bunch of probabilities and numbers anyway, this was what I was most certain about. And that was my number one choice. That was my decision. But if we say it wasn't a good idea, it can choose its number two choice. <laughs> or number three. And it can do this in a bunch of different configurations, because it's obviously very complex, and there's many different nodes. So through this process, we can continue this ad nauseum and come up with a solution that actually ends up being exactly where we want it to be in terms of our values. We can have a system that aligns with our values because we've tested it rigorously. But we don't have to explicitly define our moral truths in order to get there. If you consider reinforcement learning, like we talked about earlier, we don't know our truths well enough to just simplify them in a cost function. It would be a disaster. Instead, we can meet the machine halfway and allow it to do some of the work as well. I know it seems counterintuitive to think that the safest option is actually to take this middle path, but I really think it is the case. There are incredible benefits of self-driving cars, and we want to be able to reap those benefits of efficiency, um, safety, and so much more. And I think that the only clear way to do that properly is to allow the machine to have more freedom than we would have initially thought and make ourselves the tool of verification as a standards board and make sure that nothing bad will ever fall into the hands of consumers or those who wish to engage in the use of self-driving cars. This will enable a self-driving future and make our lives a whole lot easier. Thank you.